Hello again. Today I'm going to give a presentation about an earth mystery called the Triangle of Michael. Now I want to start occasionally, not, not going to commit myself to doing it regularly, but occasionally making videos about um, earth mysteries research that I've been involved with over the decades now. Um, so, so what are earth mysteries? Well, earth mysteries simplistically are anything to do with intrigues of the landscape. That could be a sacred site or alignments between sacred sites or unusual patterns in the land like terrestrial zodiacs or just the way certain natural features like hilltops align perfectly accidentally but wonderfully with sunrise solstice sunrises and equinox sunrises and so on but i guess underneath it all is the simple concept that the earth is sacred you know and the earth has energy more than that really if you're interested in well what's the latest the latest kind of thoughts are about plasma being an intelligent energy that the earth naturally has you know that spirits of place can use plasma to communicate there's a current kind of theory along to explain ufo sightings and visions of the virgin mary and and sightings of strange big black cats and things from the goblin universe and so on but Anyway, it all comes down to the land being much more than just rocks and mud. You know, that the land is sentient. You know, the land has spirit and the spirit of the land communicates, you know. So an attempt to understanding how some of that is understood is something that's been called earth mysteries since maybe i don't know the 1960s there's various earth mysteries groups throughout the british isles anyway like northern earth mysteries and so on aeroplane going overhead so anyway um where to begin with any of that well i'm gonna begin with an enigma called the triangle of michael and explain how that came about and and in many ways it's the first glimpse um of earth mysteries really from the last century now traditionally people will say that things like ley lines were first recognized or theorized in 1925 there was a chap called alfred watkins who wrote a book called the old straight track and he came up with this idea of ley lines you know and so but that was just his own um understanding of the energies of the land but it inspired people it inspired people to create um old straight track clubs and go looking for ley lines across the landscape you know now he began he published his book in 1925, but ley lines, or rather alignments across the land, are much older than Alfred Watkins. There's this book, uh, Lines, what's it called? Lines on the Landscape by Nigel Pennick and Paul Devereux goes into some detail of there being quite a few um, examples of alignments across the landscape acknowledged and observed long before Alfred Watkins in 1925 you know so if you're interested in pre-Alfred Watkins then this is a good book to get hold of just for the first couple of chapters and in recent years, this very fascinating book came out by Graham Robb, and um, it's incredible. It, it's, um, it shows Iron Age Celts of Gaul and other places 
having long alignments across their landscape, you know, which Graham Robb argues goes back to the pre-Iron Age, really. You know, these are old lines that were used by the Celts. You know, that will make some sense later on at the end of this presentation. So I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint presentation. I've got about 20 odd, 29 pictures to share uh, and explain things. So you just bear with me whilst I bring it up. Okay, so the story begins, this triangle of Michael, with an English occultist known by her pen name, Dion Fortune. Her real name was Violet Firth until she got married and then she became Violet Henry Evans. But her writing name is Dion Fortune. And she was a resident of Glastonbury uh, she was a prolific writer on different aspects of the occult. And she also wrote um, occult fiction, where she put some, a lot of her esoteric ideas. Now, in 1931, where's that? In 1931, she put out a call through uh, a monthly journal that was based in London called the Occult Review. Now this had, ex this had existed since, I don't know, about 1908, 1907 or something, came out monthly. And this is the front cover for the 1931 edition. And here's an inside page. So at the very bottom, you'll see it says Power Centres of Britain by Dion Fortune. So, and what she actually did is she wrote a kind of call to action. She wanted to find out about places of power and the lines of energy that connected them, you know? So I'm gonna read from my own book. I'll show you it at the end, <clears throat> but I'll read slowly so you can hear what I'm saying. There's a few quotes that I want to go through, but it's really interesting because this is really, apart from Alfred Watkins, who was simplistically looking at lays across the land, we now have an occultist looking for working with the powers of the land. It's only six years after Alfred Watkins wrote the old straight track. So in the occult review, Dion Fortune wrote, there is an immensely interesting task that is crying out to be undertaken. It is the charting of the power centers and holy places of Britain. It is a vast task, however, so vast that it is beyond the unaided scope of a single pair of hands. I am therefore appealing for help to all who are interested in our native esoteric tradition. And that's Druidism really, but she's a bit conservative. So native esoteric tradition. There are several ways in which they can do this. They can send references from books relating to our power centers. They can send records of psychic experiences obtained at power centers, and they can send photographs. Let me outline the nature of the task and the divisions into which it falls. So that's one part, it's quite a lengthy essay, so I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I'm just picking out a few things she said that are interesting. So another paragraph from the same essay in this 1931 journal, and not only are these things of antiquarian interest, but they are of immediate importance to whoever wants to experiment with our native esoteric tradition, Druidism. There is much that could be devised in the way of research and experiment when once we have begun to locate these power centers, 
Well, not only are the centers themselves of importance, but there are lines of magnetic force stretching between them. These lines form curious patterns upon the maps when they are drawn out with ruler and compass. But we only know of a few of them. And a final paragraph from the essay. You can get this essay online for free, by the way. If you go onto Wikipedia and type in the occult review, at the bottom there's links to archives where you can access this essay and read it for yourself for free. Anyway, final quote. There are certain well-known holy centers in these islands, which are of value in helping us to understand the nature of the ancient contacts because their history is well known. Ancient contacts in the landscape. She's talking about communicating with the spirits of place. Glastonbury, Iona and Lindisfarne are the three of chief importance to Celtic Christianity. Stonehenge and Avebury are our chief sun temples, that's Druidism. St Albans has some important Nordic contacts about which very little is known, that's referring to Anglo-Saxon and Viking intrigues. There is good reason to believe that Winchester has affiliations with the mystery school that hid itself behind the Arthurian legends. The Arthurian mystery school, that's the ancient mystery traditions of Greeks, Greece and Rome. And so too have Caerleon upon Usk, Avalon itself, Camelot and Tintagel. So there's a glimpse into her essay here in the 1931 March edition of the Occult Review. Again, you can, if you're interested, you can get it online for free and what read it for yourself online. So who responded to her plea? Who sent in information? Uh, we don't know, but I'm going to show some show some interesting things. So this was 1931. Four years later, 1935, Catherine Maltwood, I don't know why the tour was there. Catherine Maltwood was another Glastonbury-based lady, like Dean of Fortune. They actually were connected socially by a man called Frederick Bly Bond. They were both friends of him. I can't actually prove <clears throat> that Dion Fortune and Catherine Montwood knew each other, but they were in Glastonbury at the same time and they were their works were being mentioned in the occult review at the same time as our show. But in 1935, Catherine Montwood published her first book which was to present her idea of the Temple of the Stars. Now, the Temple of the Stars is now known as the Glastonbury Zodiac, and that's going off on a tangent. I'm not going to go into that today, but for Catherine Maltwood, it was much more than a Zodiac. It was a star temple. She doesn't just talk about the constellations of the Zodiac like Capricorn and Libra. She also talks about other constellations like Ursa Major and Orion and so on. So for her, it was much more than a zodiac. That's the 1960s nickname. For Catherine Motwood, it was a star temple, Temple of the Stars. And she believed that a massive area of Somerset mirrored the heavens. Be that as it may, she was also promoting other landscape intrigues and in the introduction to her book in 1935 she describes a triangle which is shown here that and it's from the dog's nose 
there's a great big dog on the left hand side from the dog's nose which is Borough Mump where there's a St Michael Church to Glastonbury Tor where there's a St Michael Church is 11 miles and that from St Michael's St Michael's Tower on the Tor to South Cadbury which is the bottom right hand corner is another St Michael Church is also 11 miles now if you draw a circle from the Tor to the dog's nose at Borough Mump, you end up with another St. Michael church just above my head here at Stoke St. Michael. You know, so you've got Stoke St. Michael, 11 miles to Glastonbury Tor, and then another 11 miles to Borough Mump. What's going on here? You know, these are Michael churches, 11 miles apart within which is the Star Temple. We're not going to go there. But this deliberate placement of Michael churches dates back to around the 12th century, maybe a bit earlier. So what are medieval people doing plonking Michael churches equally distanced from each other? That's the intrigue, not the zodiac, but these Michael places doing some sort of landscape geometry. So this is Catherine Maltwood putting this out there in 1935. Now, if you follow the line from Stoke St. Michael through the Tor, through Borough Mump, it also hits Creech St. Michael, another Michael church, which isn't 11 miles, but it's a Michael church in a line. So just here, you've got four Michael churches in a line. So that Catherine Mottwood had put that idea out in 1935. Now, come 1935, the Occult Review had changed its name to the London Forum. But you can see in brackets underneath it says incorporating the Occult Review. Now, uh, where is she? Close to the bottom, it says How Ritual Works by Dion Fortune. So in July 1935, Dion Fortune was still putting essays into the London Forum or the Occult Review. Just two months later, in September 1935, the second paragraph down is The Temple of the Stars, a review by Philip S. Welby. You know, that's the first public review of Catherine Maltwood's Temple of the Stars, which she published earlier this year. So we don't know what correspondence Dion Fortune received when she put a call out for knowledge about places of power. But within four years, the Temple of the Stars is being promoted in the occult forum at the same time that Dion Fortune is writing essays for the London Forum. And note that line of Michael churches anchored on Glastonbury Tor was there in the Temple of the Stars. Now, the following year, 1936, so this is the year after the Temple of the Stars came out with that Michael Church's pattern. Dion Fortune published one of her occult fictions, a brilliant book called The Goatfoot God. You know, it's a novel, it's fiction, but she used these, she used her fictions to put esoteric ideas out there. Now, the really important thing with the Goatfoot God is she filled it with earth mysteries that she'd learned since 1931, five years beforehand, you know, and I'm going to come to that shortly. But it's quite interesting that the Goatfoot God Pan is the main kind of divine figurehead being promoted in this book, back to paganism in the guise of Pan, but also connecting with past life memories and, and understanding periods of history. It's a complicated story. It's really worth reading. But just on a side note, in the year before, when Catherine Maltwood published her Temple of the Stars, she actually wrote about Pan in her chapter to do with Capricorn. 
a constellation of Capricorn in her star temple. Near the bottom, she wrote this sentence. Capricorn is identical with Pan, of whom it has been said, Pan's horns represented the rays of the sun and the brightness of the heavens was expressed by the vivacity of his complexion. As a matter of fact, he signified everything. Pan means all, it means everything. That's what the word pan means, like panorama or pandemic. You know, it's covering all things. But Capricorn literally translates as goat's horn. The word Capricorn means goat's horn and Pan is the goat for God. Now, the important thing with Capricorn is when the sun enters the sign of Capricorn, that's the winter solstice, that's the rebirth of the sun for a brand new solar year. This is why Catherine is saying um, Pan's horns represented the rays of the sun, you know, from a mystery tradition perspective. From a Celtic perspective, it would be the stag's antlers. That's a different topic. So the goat foot god has had many reprints since 1936. And it is a wonderful story. Inside, and I'm not going to quote from it because it take too long, but the main character is a man with past life memories of being a medieval monk who got killed for wanting to invoke Pan and he's trying to redo it in the 1920s or whatever um, to reconnect with spiritual source and the pagan mystery traditions and the meaning of life and all of that kind of thing and he and his friends uh, a love interest and an old wise man they discuss the landscape and in their conversations Dion Fortune reveals her concepts of places of power and lines of power connecting these places. So cutting a long story short, there's two main patterns in the goat foot god. The first is this cross. It's not a proper equal cross, but this crossing of two lines um, of places of power. So for Dion Fortune in The Goat for God, Lindisfarne was the northern power centre of England. Make of it what you will. It's just a novel, but this is obviously stuff that she's been building on. And St Albans Head is the southern power centre of England. Tintagel in Cornwall, birthplace of King Arthur, is the western power center of Cornwall and St Albans in the east is the eastern power center now they cross at Avebury and that's really important to Dion Fortune she says all of the major lines all the main lines cross at Avebury so first of all there's this concept of four north south east and west roughly power centers crossing at Avebury. So these are Dion Fortune's first um, places of power. But then in the Goatfoot God, she also promotes another pattern, which is this triangle. And this is the triangle of Michael, you know. So it's first mentioned as the triangle of Michael in the Goatfoot God, 1936. And the three places, the three corners, of the triangle of Michael is St. Michael's Church on top of Glastonbury Tor, Mont Saint Michel on the border territories between Brittany and Normandy, and St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall. Now, these three places dedicated to St. Michael create Dion Fortune's triangle of Michael. Again, uh, power centers and lines of magnetic force connecting them together. Now then, um, where am I with my thought processes? Inside the Triangle of Michael, 
I'm going to come to the three points further on, but inside them are the Channel Islands. You know, and there's some intrigues with the Channel Islands, which are going to deserve a video of their own. I'm, I'm just giving a glimpse of curiosities, really. But inside the triangle are the Channel Islands. Now, the closest that you can get to the center point of the Triangle of Michael is the north coast of the island of Guernsey. And curiously, or maybe not curiously, the north coast of Guernsey was another St. Michael place. It belonged to the Benedictine order of Mont Saint-Michel. And there was a castle there, Castle of St. Michael. Doesn't exist anymore. It fell to ruin. I don't know the details of that. Nowadays, where the castle was, there is a church. There's the church of Saint-Michel du Val. St. Michael's of the Vale, which is on the north coast of Guernsey. It's the closest you can get landmass wise to the center, the Triangle of Michael. So not only have you got this Triangle of Michael from Mont Saint-Michel to St. Michael's Mount to Glastonbury Tor, but close to its center is a Michael place established on territory that belonged to the Benedictine order. Again, like Deal Fortune's Triangle of Medieval Churches. It's the Benedictine order that take the St. Michael cult and place it onto the landscape. I'll come to that further on. Now, another intrigue is that the, the unequal cross of power centres, Linda's Farm to St. Alban's Head, if you continue that vert, kind of vertical line down, it actually bisects the island of Jersey, actually hits the centre point of Jersey. And I'm going to go into that at a future date. But the thing is, it's a bit of a deal in Jersey. Their money, their paper money, shows energy radiating out from the centre point of the island. And there is actually a centre stone marking the centre of Jersey. Sorry, the photo is a bit blurry, but you can see it says this is the stone locally known locally as the center stone because it reputedly marks the center of the island, you know. So it's just, you know, a curious intrigue that Dion Fortune's Linda's Farm, St. Alban's Head, bisects the center of Jersey, and the center of the Jersey is an esoteric intrigue of its own. Now, this is only meant to be a quick overview of the Triangle of Michael. The thing with Earth Mysteries is you can go off on tangents to other things like the Channel Islands and so on, and they all deserve videos of their own, really. So I've shown you um, Dion Fortune in 1931 calling out for information about places of power. I've shown you that in 1935, Catherine Mortwood published her Temple of the Stars and gave evidence of what I call Mortwood's Triangle, which is the medieval Michael churches making a geometric pattern. And then in 1936, Dion Fortune, her fiction, The Goatfoot God, revealing some landscape intrigues of the British Isles. And now it, you jump then from 1936 to the 1960s and 70s and there was a, a well-known author who's died now called John Michel wrote some books and in his books he referred to an enigma called the Michael line and the Michael line is built from the, uh, Catherine Maltwood's triangle of Michael places around the Temple of the Stars I'll show you that in a minute and then in the 1980s this book came out, a really, really fascinating book called The Sun and the Serpent by Paul Broadhurst and Hamish Miller. And they were dowsing. They decided to douse the line known as the St. Michael line, which comes from Catherine Maltwood's Triangle. So this St. Michael line goes simplistically from St. Michael's Mount in Cornwall to Glastonbury Tor. Um, but 
along the line are many St. Michael churches, like I've already shown you, of Stoke St. Michael and Creech St. Michael and St. Michael's on Borough Mump. Um, but more than that, it, it goes through many ancient pre-Christian sacred sites like the Hurler's Stone Circle on Bodmin Moor and A3 itself, of course, you know. So again, Dion Fortune saying that all the main lines of power cross through Avebury. Avebury is kind of the hub of the matrix of it all, if you like, from her perspective. So the fascinating thing with the Michael line is it's one side of the triangle of Michael. It's the side that, that goes from St. Michael's Mount to Glastonbury Tor. You know, and you can project that line all the way across the country, goes through many interesting places. More than that, it aligns with sunrise at Beltane and Lunasa. And these are pre-Christian things, really. So forget the medieval Michael churches. It's a later layer of activity on older pagan landscape intrigues. The line also aligns with sunset at Sawain and in bulk. But all four Celtic fire festivals signified by a single stroke, single line, a diagonal line. It's an incredible earth mystery, you know. Uh, make of it what you will. The first step would be to buy a copy of The Sun and the Serpent by Paul Broadhurst and Hamish Miller and follow their journey along the line. They followed it up some years later, I guess in the 1990s, I'm, I'm guessing there, um, with another side of the Triangle of Michael. They actually went from, they looked at the alignment between St. Michael's Mount Cornwall and Mont Saint-Michel. And it's a vast line. This is taken from their book. They they called this line the Apollo and Michael axis. And it actually starts at an island off the southwest of the country of Ireland. The island is called Skellig Michael. And there is an ancient Celtic Christian settlement there of beehive huts and stuff. And uh they recently filmed Star Wars movies there. It's where Luke Skywalker was living as a hermit in the recent Star Wars films. But Skellig Michael through St. Michael's Mount, through Mont Saint-Michel, carries on through Bourges, the esoteric centre of France, all the way down to the Holy Lands. You know, it's a massive alignment. And if you want to follow that, you want to get a copy of the Dance of the Dragon by Paul Broadhurst and Hamish Miller. So as far as I'm aware, there isn't a book yet about the third side of the triangle. I've taken the liberty of giving it the name, the Ogmius line. And I've got reasons for that because it aligns very well with the Western Isles of Scotland and the Irish Sea and all of the stones inscribed with Owen writing, which were mythologically a system created by the Irish god Ogma. And his Gallic counterpart is Ogmius, the god of um, beautiful speech and eloquence and stuff. This takes us towards glimpsing the pre-Christian um, culture of these lights across the land, you know. So I'll come to that shortly. But the Ogmius line, simplistically then, and you can look at it for yourself at home, you just draw a line from Mont Saint-Michel to Glastonbury Tor and project that line, simple. It goes through some very interesting places. It goes through the island of Portland. It goes through Maiden Castle, the biggest Iron Age hill fort, or Druidic Nemeton of the British Isles. Then it goes through Glastonbury Tor, goes through Caerleon, 
the Black Mountains, Lake Bala is the place where the mythology of Keridwin and Taliesin is anchored. Goes through Great Orm's Head, the Isle of Man, up through the Isle of Butte and the Isle of Skye, and to the stone circles of Kalanish on the Isle of Lewis. It's a fascinating line, waiting to be doused, waiting to be explored. You know, um, I'd love to do it, but time is off the essence and I've got other things I'm investigating. And of course the line projects down through France. It goes through Aquitaine and to the Pyrenees mountains, you know? So we must make of these things what we will. They're, in, they're incredible landscape features anyway. So for instance, Mont Saint-Michel, the southern part of the Triangle of Michael. It became the main power place of the area for the Benedictine order. And the Benedictine order took the Michael cult with them wherever they went. The lands of Jersey, territories in Jersey and Guernsey were owned by the Benedictine order of the Michael cult hence the Michael Castle and Michael Church near the center of the Triangle of Michael. And it was the Benedictine Order of Mont Saint-Michel who also took St. Michael's Mount, you know, and they, they gave it their Michael cult, the same story of fishermen seeing a vision of the Archangel Michael, and that's why they created a church there is told at St. Michael's Mount, is told at Mont Saint-Michel. It's the same, they just transplanted a, a myth, really. Um, and the Benedictine order had the Abbey at Glastonbury, of course, you know. So, but what was there before the Benedictine order and Michael? Well, there's evidence that Mont Saint-Michel was related with the Mithraic cult, during Roman times. Um, Roman deities that would be akin to uh, uh, Michael or a, would be Mithras and Apollo, you know. So Mithras or Apollo being in an area, the Benedictines would say, oh, well, that's Michael. We claim that as a Michael place, you know. It's light triumphant over darkness. But as long ago as 1910, uh, I've forgotten the name of the book, but it was understood that Michael places in France and Britain um, were a, a, a renaming of places that were sacred to the Celtic god of light, whoever that may be. You know, no one really knows who the Celtic god of light would be, but I mean, a, an intelligent guess would be Lou or Lugus, uh, Lou is triumphant over the forces of darkness, you know, and Caesar said that the favourite god of the Celts was Mercury, and that fits with Lugus in Gaul very, very well. But anyway, so when you're looking at these places of power, you're looking at the landscape, and the landscape has gone through many, many layers of activity um, before the medieval monks claiming it for Michael, there were Roman sites dedicated to Mithras and Apollo and so on. And before the Romans had put their layer on top, these places had been Celtic sanctuaries to their gods of light or forces triumphant over darkness, you know, in the Iron Age times. And before the Celts had done that, the Bronze Age people had been busy at these locations, you know, building and building stone circles and dolmens aligning with sunrises and so on. So the land, the spirits of the land carry all these memories, you know, and when you go somewhere, you have to tune in to the radio station, you know, tuning into the Bronze Age or you're tuning into the Iron Age or you're tuning into Roman times or you're tuning into medieval monks, you know, these places hold all of that around Mont Saint-Michel in the water. There's a fossilized forest. You know, this was 
there was an ancient forest here that's now fossilized by the sea and stuff, you know, so so many layers. Hormor, St. Michael's Mount was intimately connected with the Bronze Age tin trade of Cornwall, you know, thousands of years before it was dedicated to St. Michael. It was an important point of contact between the southwest of Britain and the Celtic sea trade or what became the Celtic sea trade it would have been Phoenician tin traders or something thousands of years beforehand you know so the, these places would have had shrines they would have had temples they would have had kind of early lighthouses with fire beacons you know they could communicate across the landscape from fire beacon to fire beacon you know the, the christian structures of the 12th century are just a rather late stage you know glastonbury tour you know look, there is plenty of evidence for it having a romano celtic pagan temple long before it had a christian church on top you know it dominates the landscape they found roman roof tiles roman pottery and so on um but the point is you know from saint michael's Mount in cornwall to glastonbury tour carry on the line you'll end up in avebury these are old lines predating christianity you know Fascinating. So underneath the triangle of Michael, underneath um, the mythology of the Christian monks and stuff, you know, really they're just still working with the energies of the land and seeing certain places of power as resonating with those forces that overcome darkness so it doesn't really matter if you're saying michael from a christian perspective or you're saying apollo and mithras from a roman perspective or whether you're saying lu from a celtic perspective or whatever the bronze age people believed in you know these were places of light triumphant over darkness and they're more often than not observing the sun like sunrises at Beltane and Samhain and Lunasur and so on you know it's that druidic sun worship thing whatever across the landscape so um some book plugs then I really recommend Graham Robb's book if you want to see lines across Europe dating to before Roman times, you want to get hold of this book. You know? um, if you're interested to learn more about the revelations given by Dion Fortune and Catherine Maltwood, there's this book of mine available on Amazon, The Terrestrial Alignments of Catherine Maltwood and Dion Fortune. You can see the triangle of Michael on the cover, but there's many more alignments and patterns in the landscape the triangle of michael is just one of them so that's available on amazon and medieval history of glastonbury understanding the benedictines and what they were up to and other things other intrigues glastonbury and the myths of avalon also incorporates landscape enigmas in somerset and in france you know, the Benedictine order were also anchored at the centre of France, a place called Vézelay in an area called the Avalone. So Mont Saint-Michel, St. Michael's Mount, Glastonbury Tour, all can be traced back to the Benedictines at Vézelay, which was a sacred mountain hill um, known as Scorpion Hill. And in Romian, Romian? Roman times, it had a temple of Bacchus on top and it was surrounded by grapevines. So that temple of Bacchus would have been the Romans putting their layer on top of a Celtic god. And if you're interested in the pagan temple, the Romano Celtic temple on Glastonbury Tor, there's this little book also available on Amazon.
pagan temple at Glastonbury Tor. Okay, thank you. I will do some more presentations about other earth mysteries in the months to come, but I really wanted to just get the triangle of Michael out there. It felt important to do that. So thank you very much for listening to me ramble. Uh, leave feedback in the comments below. Thank you very much.